going to tell you all about our project Immortality. Um, this was already going to be a loose and ramshackle presentation. Um, and then the organizer of this, of this conference decided to schedule my talk first thing in the morning, the day after the awards show. So uh, I'm going to try and get through it and uh, we'll, we'll pull together. Um, I want to get to like a nice substantial Q&A. So I'm going to try and power through it. Apologies, anyone that has to try and keep up with me. Uh, so let's go. I'll start my timer. So I know what the hell I'm doing. Um, so I'm Sam Barlow. I'm a game director, designer, writer. Um, I founded this company, Half Mermaid Productions, uh, to go and make interesting narrative games. Uh, why are we called Half Mermaid? Uh, it's a fun story. Uh, when we started my last project, Telling Lies, uh, we had to set up an entity to go make things and do all the legal stuff. And the lawyer rang me up and was like, oh shit, we need a name for your company. It has to be unique and interesting. And on the spur of the moment, uh, I thought of this dream project that I had, um, which was an idea for a movie about Alfred Hitchcock uh, working with Esther Williams. If you don't know who Esther Williams is, uh, this is Esther Williams. Uh, she was at the height of her fame, probably the most famous film star at the time, and she was known for making movies in which she would swim. Uh, she kind of invented uh, like the Olympic sport of synchronized swimming, and she would do these elaborate musical spectacles involving swimming. And like her story was fascinating because she had aspirations to be uh, more significant as an actress to take on work that didn't just involve swimming. And so the idea for this movie was you'd kind of have Alfred Hitchcock at the end of his career and he's kind of fading and he comes together with Esther and they both want to make something special. And the focus of this movie would be Hitchcock wanting to shoot the most elaborate drowning sequence that ever been conceived. And so the name of this movie was Drowning a Mermaid, which was nicely kind of ironic. So that became the name of the company. And then when we started Immortality and we decided we were going to self-publish, we realized that without the context I've just given you, Drowning a Mermaid sounded kind of aggressive and scary as a company name. So we kind of morphed it into Half Mermaid, acknowledging that all of us, at least from the top up, are Half a Mermaid. Um, and uh, this is significant because that dream project I had, this idea of exploring this combination of, of director and actress and the, the creative tensions, um, essentially uh, found a new form in uh, ultimately uh, the project Immortality, which if you haven't played Immortality, I am probably going to spoil everything. Um, so you have, I don't know, like three minutes if you can download it on your phones uh, before it's all going to be ruined for you. Uh, Immortality is a video game about exploring footage from three lost movies and answering initially the question, what happened to Marissa Marcel, the star of these three movies? It was the first indie game ever to get a perfect score of 10 in Edge magazine. And uh, last night, we won two awards. So. We clearly did something right. And if you follow all the steps I lay out here, you can recreate that success. It's very reproducible. These, you know, this is a, a template you can just apply to your own projects. Um, so I'm going to zoom back out and I'm going to kind of start from the, the higher level philosophies and goals that drive what we're doing. And hopefully if we have time, I'll get to the spreadsheets, which I know is the thing that everyone is here to hear about. So like, what is there a driving mission behind what we're doing at Half Mermaid and, and kind of what is my mission in games in general? And for me, it's kind of crystallized, especially over the last few games, to be about storytelling and the form of storytelling. And for me, if I look back at the 20th century, um, which, you know, I was born in the 20th century, as my kids remind me, uh, I was born in the late 20th century, which makes me sound like an antique. Um, the 20th century as, as a period of storytelling for me is defined by broadcast, right? This is the big game changer 
uh, you've gone from traditional storytelling techniques, kind of oral storytelling, uh, in-person theatrical storytelling, and you have the popularity of radio that then blossoms into kind of network TV and cinema, where a storyteller can create a, a beautiful piece of storytelling and then share it with a huge audience, right? And, and that audience can then absorb and react, and there is a sense of kind of global community around it, but it's, it's, it's so powerful. And like my go-to, this is like the best fact ever. Um, my go-to kind of example of like how powerful this moment was and this transformation to broadcast was uh, in the 50s, Orson Welles did a live TV version of King Lear. Um, when this version of King Lear was broadcast, more people watched the live TV version of King Lear than had ever watched any performance of King Lear in the entire history of humanity prior to that day. So you get this sense of like the seismic shift from like how stories were told and distributed and the scale at which they operated. Once we hit broadcast, you know, the, the, the scale is obscene. Um, and that is, is such an interesting and powerful thing. So now that we're in the 21st century, what is my sense of like what is going to define the forms of storytelling that we create? And for me, it's all tied up in like digital, right? What does it mean to tell stories through digital media? What does that enable? And for me, the initial beautiful first step is, is what I call throwing away the container. So if you look at, take movies as an example, the, the structure of a movie, the fact that it's like 90 minutes to two hours roughly, um, the act structure is very specific. Like the container of movies exists for very practical purposes, right? If you want to distribute a movie, you need to print it on film, put it in a can, at least you used to, drive it to the movie theater, play it. If you're broadcasting a television show, naturally you have a single static version of this show that then gets blatted out to everybody. And again, there are restrictions there, right? The 30 minute show or the 45 minute show, act structures based around commercial breaks, these very specific containers that you know, exist for very practical reasons. If I'm watching a movie, there is a, a limitation to the human bladder. Uh, the movie theaters wanna schedule multiple movies throughout the day for commercial reasons. So we have all these kind of restrictions that come with this kind of 20th century version of broadcast. But now that we're digital, uh, we can throw those away entirely, right? And I think up until now, the disruptive kind of digital storytelling media has tweaked the container, right? Netflix might say, oh, we can have a 35, 36, 37 minute episode. Or maybe Stranger Things can be two and a half hours long or an hour long. Is it a movie? Is it TV? But these are all like very subtle shifts. They're still writing these pieces of television in the same structure with the same container, with the same uh, usage of plot as this kind of guiding principle. So for me, the real opportunity that we have and coming from games is to throw these containers away and what happens then? What do you do in the absence of the container? And for me, if you look at the core pillars of what video games do best and can do best, um, these are the means by which we can navigate this much more open, interesting space for storytelling. Uh, so here are my four pillars. Um, in the background there, that's the, the pillars of Nosgoth, which is a little bit of foreshadowing, if you take note. Um, and the four pillars for me are challenge, right? Uh, as human beings, if you put an obstacle in my path, if you give me a riddle or question, I'm naturally inclined to want to overcome that obstacle, to solve the riddle, to, to answer the questions. So challenge is this really interesting driver. When you give people agency and control in a piece of storytelling, that's gonna really drag them in and give them that sense of immersion. Expression is, I think, like my favorite. Uh, when I think of expression, I think of uh, like Nintendo. And I think of playing Mario, uh, which is a game in which Nintendo say, here is this game about running and jumping, but the mechanics of that game give you a richness and a fluidity to allow you to express yourself through how you run and jump, right? Any two people playing Mario are gonna navigate differently. There's like a real kind of nice possibility space within that mechanic. And I think what differentiates my games often with some other narrative games is, is really paying attention to how can the player express themselves through how they interact with this story and finding mechanics and structures which 
open up to that expressivity. Uh, the third pillar, exploration, is obviously like a fundamental feature of a lot of video games. Um, you know, as a, a kind of hunter-gatherer species, we are predisposed to dig exploration, right? Being led by a sense of curiosity, discovery. These are kind of key fundamental aspects to a lot of traditional video games. And I think, again, what I've been doing is trying to take a lot of those verbs around exploration and apply them directly to the story itself. Um, and that's been kind of a fascinating journey. Um, and then the fourth pillar uh, is the one that kind of we sometimes take for granted. Like video games are very good at simulating things. Uh, we can simulate physics and vehicles and bullets and have AI that has like you know, an abstracted simulation of, of some kind of creature. And so we kind of lean on that a lot because it's very interesting as a human to interact with a simulation and try and kind of grok the rules of the simulation. What I found over the years working in games was that as a storyteller, I would lean on the simulation as a prop. Like it would give me free immersion, it would involve players, but I, I kind of questioned how useful it was for my, specifically my storytelling. And so starting with her story in 2015, I kind of explicitly gave myself the challenge of make a video game with no simulation, uh, no state changes, no tracking of, of, of kind of structure. Can I still create an experience which is enjoyable and immersive? So given this kind of approach, uh, the last few games I've made, I set out, so with her story, where I was exploring a lot of these ideas for the first time, the idea was to deconstruct a detective story take a, a type of story that the audience is familiar with, knows all the tropes, take that knowledge, and then use that to, to kind of fuel the experience by breaking it down into atomic elements, letting people freely navigate. They could themselves kind of rebuild and reconstruct the idea of a detective story. And I followed this up with telling lies, and like the use of video in her story was somewhat instinctive. Like it, there wasn't a lot of conscious thinking about why I did that. Um, but looking back with Telling Lies, I started to think about what was interesting about this technique of using video. And the kind of stated mission of Telling Lies was to make an anti-movie. It was like all the things which make this distinct from the traditional forms of movies, the structure of it, the pacing of it, the way we shoot it, were kind of driving the idea of Telling Lies. And so both of these kind of culminate in immortality, where we kind of then revisited a cinematic aesthetic and said, well, what happens if we deconstruct movies themselves, right? If we start to break apart how movies work, why movies work, how they're made, and kind of really dig into that. And it unlocked some extremely ambitious and challenging questions. So it's sort of like a, a kind of fun thing to do. So also driving this, uh, I have like my pillars of what is a video game, right? And as I'm working on a game, I'll keep returning to those, right? Is this expressive enough? Is there a meaningful challenge? Uh, you know, how does the exploration work? Are we empowering the player with our exploration? But the, the kind of other method I have, which is sort of fundamental to my process, is I have these three aspects of the game. And the logic is, if I have all three of these in place, this is gonna be a good game. And if I don't have a clear idea of all three of these, do not start making game. Like, this is kind of the, the, the early kind of sanity check of is there an actual solid core here? And, and as well, it like helps with when the game's finished, is it gonna be sellable? Is it gonna be explainable? Is this something I can market? Like the whole kind of concept gets tied up here. So the method is to come up with uh, a theme, right? So the theme is, what is the question that we're exploring here? And it might be a question I don't have an answer to. Um, in fact, those are the best types. So for example, her story, the theme there was kind of identity, our external and internal identities and the extent to which they're shaped by the environment. That was like, you know, conscious brain, what are we actually grappling with in this story? And then there's the emotion and, and this is kind of key to me is, as a storyteller, I want to have uh, a really specific emotion that I felt that I want to communicate. And it, to communicate that needs an experience, right? If I was to just put it into words, it would sound trite or unspecific. 
So like, how do we create an experience and, and through living that experience, have the player feel this emotion? So for example, in Telling Lies, the emotion was, how does it feel to have been in a relationship that's failed, but still hold in your head the memories of the happy memories of when that relationship was working, right? And it's a very complicated part of being a human is, is holding these conflicting emotions and still having the spark and the way that memory works. Like there was this real gnarly little emotion there. And it was like, how do we get people to experience that and, and, and think about it? Because if I express it like I just did, it, it's kind of lame. And then uh, a key thing is the metaphor. I call it, I think I'm slightly breaking the use of the word metaphor. The idea here is what is, what is the metaphor and, and kind of it becomes the mechanic that describes the game. And this becomes a really useful communication tool to the player. So for example, with her story, the metaphor was that moment in a police show where the detective is sat at the computer and they've run out of leads. They're at the end, you know, it's, it's, they've run out of leads, they're at the end of their tether and they sit, it's 3 a.m. and they're just going through the police database looking for that one little clue that'll break the case wide open. Or in an older movie, it'd be like a micro feature. They're just going through old newspapers until they see something. <gasps> and that was like, oh, that's, that's the core mechanic of her story. And that is this metaphor. So then if you build the game around that, when you then show players the game, they get it because they recognize this thing. And, and you know, the question is, is this a useful metaphor for the story we're telling? Like, is this going to be something that you can wrap these themes and emotions in? And so, yeah, the process is to really use this as just like a way of analyzing a piece of game design and going, do I have these three things? And, you know, maybe it's easier to do this in the indie space, but also like throw out the crap that is extraneous to this, right? If you can kind of focus on these three things, that gives you a tight and cohesive piece of game. So doing this process on immortality, our theme, which was uh, absurdly ambitious uh, was why do human beings tell stories? And, you know, we're like, if we're going to do something that's about cinema and looking back at the 20th century and, and cinema as the great storytelling form of the 20th century, this is a, 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 you know, an opportunity to ask these very deep questions. Um, and it was exciting to give myself permission to ask something as ambitious and silly as this, because sometimes you try and kind of scope things down and you feel like, oh, this is uh, like overreaching or it could end up awkward if we try and answer these big questions. Um, and you know, with this project, it really became tied up in like, to what extent is our mortality part of this? Uh, you know, oftentimes you look at people creating pieces of art, creating stories, and sometimes the objective is to use it as an immortality project, to create something that will live beyond them, right? And is that a useful and healthy thing to do? So this was like the theme that we set out to explore. The emotion um, was, again, it always sounds trite when you try and express it, but uh, struggling with the impossibility of creating the perfect story. Uh, and it was like, if, if storytelling is something we're driven to do, if there are kind of primal reasons for it, the most interesting way to explore that is a case of failure, right? So uh, this fella here is from the cancelled Legacy of Kane game that I spent three years of my life working on. Um, was the most challenging thing I worked on and, and the biggest failure probably of my career. And uh, that had like, I, after that I went and did some stuff and I did her story. So it's slowly been kind of repressed and buried all my feelings of this project. And as we started to build this one, I'm like, oh shit, this is all, this is all about that Legacy of Kane game. Because you know, there's such a, a commonality between movies and games in terms of the number of people you need, the expense, the technology, right? These are very challenging places to try and tell a story and, and tell a true and pure story because there's just so much going on. So you know, I, I really wanted to try and tap into how that felt, why did I work so hard? Why did I push myself so hard at the expense of my family and the rest of my life to try and make this Legacy of Kane game, which was a constant struggle? Um, and how did it feel when it failed? And, you know, trying to put that into an experience for you all 
to enjoy. Uh, then the metaphor uh, became the moviola. Um, this was like the very first design doc for the project uh, was this little picture of Pikachu with moviola. Um, it, it's a slightly mixed metaphor. It's, we can kind of expand it and say it's uh, the moviola of the editing suite, right? The, the metaphor became, imagine you're in an editing room uh, and you have all this footage, right? That process where uh, in making a movie, the editor sits down to do the assembly cut and they have everything that's been filmed. There's this vast amount of footage and they start organizing it and obsessing over it and looking at it and picking out the good takes and going frame by frame and just really immersing themselves in the, the beauty of the film and slowly they assemble a movie. And so that kind of was our sort of guiding principle um, and the mechanics of that and, and kind of wanting to explore the, the tactile nature of film as a medium versus the kind of more digital stuff we're familiar with. Um, but even at this point, the presence of Pikachu shows that we were aware that we were also making um, Pokemon Snap, essentially. And, and this was another way that I justified, like, this project's going to work. Because like, we're doing some weird stuff and we have these ideas, but like, I've played Pokemon Snap and that was fun. And people liked Pokemon Snap. So this is going to work. So then the next thing that we do, and this is like been a huge difference for me going from like the AAA space or the, the bigger project space to being an indie and being able to kind of define how projects work. Um, and it is specificity. And to be honest, like all I ask of a game these days is to have some specificity. Like I want some real crunchy little special unique details. I want to feel like I'm engaging with something that's very authentic and specific. Like I, know I just uh, recently finished playing Pentiment, right? And I was like, oh, this is some like, <laughs> this is like a deep, deep dive into a particular fetish for this period of like <laughs> history. Like I'm, I'm feeling enriched by interacting with this. It doesn't feel like a mishmash of generic stuff. Um, and the 100% reliable recipe I have for imbuing a game with specificity is research. Um, so on this project, we spent a year, year and a half of a two and a half year project was researching and outlining and writing and thinking about this stuff. Um, and I have like another cheesy tool that I call the list, which is, you know, I will basically go and read everything on a subject, just read hundreds of books, watch as much footage, read academic papers, just everything I can get my hands on. And as I'm going, if I find a really interesting little detail, um, I'll add it to a list. And at the end of this process, I just have this really long list just full of these little textures or details or moments that I've never seen before that feel fresh. And it's kind of this little toolkit that I have as we then start to actually assemble the story and the process and the mechanics of like, oh, there's that little thing. I've been looking for a way to use that and insert that. Um, but yeah, the research, reading, it's so easy now to just go online and, and convince yourself that you've researched something. But if you sit down and read like three different autobiographies of someone, you just get like a volume of genuine like human detail. That's interesting. So to give you an idea, we're gonna watch a bunch of videos now. Oh, actually, I'm gonna intro you first. So we started thinking about this idea of, of Exploring movie making, um, answering these questions, trying to explore this idea of failure and the struggle. Um, so for me, like I have a particular love and interest in the idea of lost movies. Uh, so here we got a, a shot from a movie that Orson Welles, he shot like half of called The Deep, which was an adaptation of the book Dead Calm, which is one of my favorite thriller novels. Um, he never completed it, he ran out of money. In fact, Orson Welles ran out of money a lot. Uh, later in his career. Like he probably has the record for the greatest number of lost movies. Um, and, and it's like this, this perfect encapsulation of what we're talking about because if the purpose of art is to create an immortality project, uh, a lost movie is a failure, right? You put all this effort in and it never comes out. Uh, it's, it's this radical example of failure, but it still lives, right? I get excited thinking about this movie that never happened and I see a couple of frames from it and a few clips from it and that's so evocative and interesting and my brain starts working and thinking about it. So it's also got like this nuance to it. Um, 
And then similarly, like there are movies that have come out. So like uh, Eyes Wide Shut was something of a kind of North Star for this project. Um, that is, uh, I mean, Kubrick in general has all this, you know, there's so many conspiracy theories and there's just so much interesting stuff that people dig into with his movies. But Eyes Wide Shut is, is fascinating. So Kubrick spent his entire career trying to make this movie. Uh, from the very beginning, he was constantly trying to adapt this book that it was based on. Um, at various points, they almost made it with Woody Allen as the star, which is a, an alternate path that we had luckily kind of diverged from. There was a version with Steve Martin. He had John le Carre write a treatment. Um, he just kept trying to figure out how to make this movie, and it ended up being his last movie, right? And he literally died before finishing this movie. In fact, this movie killed him. Um, so when Kubrick died, the version of Eyes Wide Shut that's out there was not a finished edit. It was like, you know, 90%. And Kubrick was also famous for continuing to edit the movie even after it had premiered. Um, and it's, it's this idea of struggle and failure as well. Like this at the time was the longest ever movie shoot. There was all this kind of intrigue and interest around what was going on, why this movie was running for so long, what was happening with Tom and Nicole. Uh, and, and fascinating things like Harvey Keitel and Jennifer Jason Lee were in this movie, shot out 90% of their scenes. And then when it ran for so long, they had to recast them and reshoot it all. So it's even a movie that came out is full of all these what ifs and potential versions that could have existed. Um, you know, so the idea that the, the kind of finished ultimate version, like, is that the perfect version that Kubrick spent his whole life trying to make? Um, you know, and all those kind of unlived possibilities are kind of fascinating. So this was, you know, we started to kind of hone in on this and this idea, well, how about we make our subject lost movies, right? The idea that we're exploring and, and kind of unearthing and bringing back to life these lost movies felt like a really nice way to explore our themes. Um, and then we, we kind of quickly in just reading a lot of the history of movie making kind of realized that like the the most extreme and intense character to explore the sacrifices and struggles and challenges of trying to express yourself and tell stories would be the actress right when you read about it, what goes on in the making of a movie and the history of making of movies and the power structures this was like the absolute locus of like all of these forces uh, so, for example, uh, the person on the left there is Margarita Cancino, um, and on the right is the person she became. Uh, the, the movie studios picked her and decided to transform her. Uh, she underwent painful plastic surgery, and this was like old school plastic surgery. Um, they changed her ethnicity, they changed her name, uh, they kind of essentially rebuilt her from the ground up, and uh, she was their creation, right? Under the studio system, they owned her. Rita Hayworth was this new entity that they had created. So it's like this real apex of like that sacrifice of self to essentially allow yourself to re be rebuilt um, in, in service of the storytelling. But at the same time, there was this nuance as well of like thinking now from, from the 21st century, like Rita Hayworth has survived. There is something of her soul that when we watch her movies, lives beyond the screen and we don't talk about the studio heads who created her right and and all the other people that were part of all these different power systems and all these mechanisms like there's something where she has kind of survived and she does still live on through this footage of her and so this idea of like a star this idea of a, of an actress who's brought in and kind of molded felt like a really useful kind of locus as our main character to explore some of these themes. I also started to get really into hair, realized that hair was super important in our story. Um, so here on the right, this is Rita Hayworth in The Lady from Shanghai, um, a film that she filmed with Orson Welles, who at that point was her ex. So like all of those complexities and different power dynamics were extremely complicated in this movie. And Orson Welles decided that for this movie, she should cut her signature hair and dye it blonde. And Harry Cohn, who was the studio head, 
when he heard of this, was absolutely furious. He was like, we created Rita Hayworth. The hair is like 50% of who Rita Hayworth is. And so you had these two guys. One was the guy who created her and owned her. The other was her ex, who was also her director, both arguing about what she should be doing with her hair. And it's like, that's kind of screwed up. Um, and the hair continues, right? So um, we started to get really interested in Jane Fonda as well, because she occupied this this beautiful moment where uh, film changed, right? We went from the studio system into kind of new Hollywood and tracking her career, she was an actress who was able to actually assert herself and gain some agency and start taking on roles and sort of transform what she was doing. And with her hair, uh, so in, in Barbarella, a film in which she was directed by her then lover, Roger Vadim, uh, and, and Roger Vadim would... Uh, take these actresses that he was in relationships with and create movies and kind of, he was in love with the fantasy of them that he created on the camera and he was extremely controlling. And so for him, the idea of the beautiful blonde uh, woman was like his, his archetype. And at a point in her life where Jane Fonda was discovering feminism and was trying to assert herself and change her career, she went out, got a hairdresser and they cut the hair went back to a natural color and the what became known as the clute haircut was born. So there's a lot, there's, there's so much hair, hair trivia that we were just like, oh, this is like such a big deal and it's so kind of interesting, the, the nuance that it brings. Um, here we've got some videos. Uh, so we were watching like so much video. I became obsessed with uh, talk shows, right? I watched like a hundred hours of Dick Cavett, which is, I recommend it. Um, and there's something really interesting about these actresses coming out being interviewed so they're playing a version of themselves and uh it was at points excruciating because uh, all of the sexism and the power dynamics uh are fully on display in a lot of this stuff so this was this is from like i guess the the 80s this is phoebe cates with letterman um i have a particular, <laughs> particular love of uh grungy video so clips like this are my I love this shit. Look at this. This is beautiful. Um, this constant obsession with the age of actresses and their youth and their perfection and, and how moldable and controllable they are. It's uh, quite an honor, I guess, huh? Yeah, it's a real honor. Yeah. You look very young in person. Yeah, everybody says that. Yeah, you look like, uh, I don't know, 15, 16, maybe? Oh, well, yeah, maybe. Yeah. And <laughs> can we tell folks how... The rest of the interview gets worse. Um, <laughs> He was a complete sleaze. Okay, what we got next? Okay, so this, this was another clip that kind of was, had pride of place on our mood board. So this is Olivia, Olivia Hussey with her co-star in the Romeo and Juliet movie uh, at the end of the 60s. Uh, they were both like 15, 16 when they filmed this, uh, this movie. And they're being interviewed by uh, a very kind of BBC-ish uh, British interviewer. Um, and there's this small little clip here, which YouTube loves, like the YouTube commenters love this, this stuff because it's all about smoking. Personal question, Olivia. Um, <laughs> I noticed that you're, you're at 15. That's pretty young to be smoking cigarettes, isn't it? Mm. <clears throat> when did you start? At about 14. About 14. While you were doing the prime of Miss Jean Brody? Yes. Mm. Well, just before then, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that, that is pretty young. There aren't many girls at 15, I know, that smoke cigarettes publicly. Oh, there are. And uh, what are your... Uh, yeah, she spends like the whole interview smoking like a chimney. Um, but that little beat, like, the whole interview, this BBC guy is, is treating her like some slightly exotic, precocious creature, and he's very intrigued by uh, you know, her, her strength of character or whatever. Um, but the look she gave him, and she was like, you don't know shit about teenage girls and what they're up to. That like I, I, that stuck with me, and I started watching a lot of these uh, clips. A lot of it was like kind of a fantasy wish fulfillment thing of like, wouldn't it be great if like, as a as an exaggeration and reflection of actually how much strength of character these actresses have to sit there and just kind of smile through this crap. Um, if actually inside of them there was something even more powerful uh, that could just step up and rip the head off this interviewer or, you know, had uh, a, a lived experience or a, a wisdom that was far in excess of what you're thinking. Um, and that kind of 
grew into the fantasy element of this game. Um, bring it next. For too much video, miss. Okay, so then um, another character that I kind of became obsessed with, um, and interestingly paralleled the story of, of Jane Fonda and where Jane Fonda was able to actually kind of emerge and gain control. Uh, Jean Seberg, you see here, did not. Um, she was uh, an actress who was kind of cast from obscurity by Otto Preminger uh, into a movie where he literally burned her alive um, on set and, and was a big failure. She had this incredible moment where she essentially ushered in the new wave by starring in Goddard's Breathless, but subsequent to that, uh, her career didn't work. Uh, she was constantly trying to seek out meaningful work uh, and, and the system, the men around her uh, consistently failed her and then she kind of died tragically. Um, so kind of getting really deep into her story became like a big part of the thought process of trying to create this character of Marissa Marcel. Uh, this clip here is the first time she appeared on television ever. Um, this is like a deep archival thing. So the quality is amazingly bad it's beautiful like the the generation loss is, is exquisite but check out some of the body language in here it's actually uh, kind of excruciating exact moment you know here are the two principles in the most exciting adventure in show business in the last 25 years the gentleman here you probably recognize him the distinguished producer and director from hollywood otto preminger so let's have a nice welcome <laughs> Before I introduce this youngster, I want to tell you the story that Otto Preminger conceived and carried out. He, is, well, he has the right to Shaw's St. Joan for the movie. And he thought to himself that wearing of the star system temporarily, that this time he was going to find a girl, an unknown, and so he scouted through all of the United States, and then in most of the countries of Europe and in Canada, and out of probably 18,000 girls, I believe, submitted their applications and their backgrounds. And then Otto reduced this to 3,000. He tested all of those. And this youngster here, Jean Seberg, is the one who caught lightning in a bottle because of her talent and her beauty and the qualities that Otto was looking for. So let's have a wonderful hand for this 17-year-old youngster. Uh, and then we talked about Jane Fonda already. Um, we really kind of zoomed in on this moment in her life when she had this reinvention and she was living in 70s New York, um, hanging out with Warhol, who himself was doing some very interesting explorations. Warhol studio called The Factory is on Union Square. We called there, no result. He was at a farewell party for Jane Fonda on the SS France. We're doing a picture together. Okay, Candy we're, darling. Well, we're calling you blonde on a bum trip. <laughs> Jane Fonda is going to be in Warhol's next movie. At least she thought so. Warhol did not. I hope. Um, so, you know, building up all this research, like we, we, we then kind of zoomed on in this idea, well, the most extreme version of the idea of this lost movie, of this struggle and this creative struggle would be somebody who uh, has filmed several movies, but all of them are lost, right? This idea of this actress who films three movies and none of them have survived. So it's like the ultimate kind of version of this idea. And we started trying to, responding to all this research, kind of orchestrate and, and pick where we put these in the history of film. So we had uh, our first movie at the tail end of the studio system, this idea of a director who is uh, out of fashion, a kind of late period Hitchcock style director, um, who you know is coming from the studio system where everything is fake and owned. And uh, you know, it's things that would have felt extremely cinematic and exciting early in their career now feel more dated and theatrical. And then we contrast that with this jump to the new Hollywood in the early 70s, particularly in New York, where filmmaking becomes more organic and authentic. Uh, we have this idea of like 70s filmmaking being this kind of ideal of like grown up cinema. Um, and we wanted to kind of interrogate that. 
And then for our final movie, we give ourselves a little interesting time jump and we're at the end of the millennium where everyone's kind of looking back. You have the invention and explosion of the indie movie, which is all these young people who are looking back at the 70s and being like, this was the good shit and we're going to try and replicate that. Um, and it was kind of the last hurrah before everything became digital. So this gave us like this interesting arc to explore, right? And have this character live through these different moments. And we were able to, to figure out different aspect ratios. So we'd have this kind of nice uh, explorability of, of seeing footage from these different eras and being able to recognize where we were. Um, okay, I'm gonna get to the mechanics. I'm gonna have to go fast, otherwise we won't get to the spreadsheets. Um, so whilst we're doing all this research and outlining and thinking, um, we're also in parallel, like prototyping the mechanics. Uh, so we kind of have the time to let those bed in and get the right game feel. So the Moviola, uh, I talked about, you know, this idea of putting you in the editing room. And we wanted to hit something, uh, you know, I, I pitched someone early on about this and they were like, so is it like Final Cut? Are you like gamifying Final Cut? It was like, well, no, because that's like the prosaic bit. What we want more is like you're in the editing suite with the editor, right? You're looking over their shoulder and you're reaching into this bin and pulling out footage and putting it in the machine and then discovering what's on it, right? We wanted to give you that, that the excitement of that and the tactile nature of that without a lot of the prosaic stuff. So the, the Moviola became this focus. Uh, we had like 15 hours of recordings of Moviola sounds that we started trying to kind of uh, use and, and concatenate. And then uh, there was this piece of research that I just kept going back to. And this was uh, Nick Rogue uh, when he, so the film director Nick Rogue, when he started out, he was like a T-boy at one of the studios. And he talks about, and, and this part of his biography, he talks about the moment where he first saw, uh, this was an editola, which is the same thing as a movieola. Um, first time he saw footage running and he could turn it backwards and he could play with the speed of it. And he was just like, mind blown. Like this was magical to him that he could manipulate time uh, and it fundamentally changed his understanding of filmmaking and storytelling. Um, and in the, same, in the same biography, he then goes on to say, so the Editola was like a PlayStation 3 for me. So he was writing this a few years back. Um, and just like you read that when you're doing your research and you're like, holy shit, like he's, he's telling us what to do, right? Oh, we're going to take the PlayStation 5 and make it into a movie early. We're going to flip that equation. Um, but he understood that there was something like playful and, and kind of tactile and exploratory about that experience for him. Um, this is, I put this clip in as an indulgence, but I don't know if I can, I'll, I'll indulge myself. Uh, so this, you see this in his work, uh, in the film Walkabout, he uses um, the manipulation of the footage to express some subjectivity. So in this movie, some evil hunters shoot this buffalo and we see the buffalo die. Um, and then Rogue starts screwing around uh, to try and express something. Uh, so he does this zoom right into the grain of the footage, right? The, breaking it down into its kind of atomic elements. And then along comes this kid who, by the way, is Nick Rogue's son. His movie making is always incestuous and complicated. Um, along comes this, this young boy and he's so, uh, kind of traumatized by seeing this buffalo die. We have these freeze frames where like time stands still. Um, and he looks over and cause he's willing the buffalo to not be dead. We then see from his perspective, the footage of the buffalo in reverse, coming back to life again. Uh, this was like an obsession of Nick Rogues. And, and we really dug into that as well. This idea that Playing the footage back was, was a way of resurrecting something and bringing something back to life. And um, if you have played Immortality, you might see some moments or scenes in this where the idea of playing things backwards as a way of resurrecting, the idea that the existence of this footage and your manipulation of it is a way of bringing someone back to life is, is kind of a big core beat of, of that story. Uh, and as a side note, uh, using your marketing to foreshadow your big story beats and the endings of your stories is awesome and you should do it. Um, so we just, yeah, every time we talked about immortality, on early teaser trailers, we put out these images of this fire and these flaming posters. So even before people were playing the game, we were preparing them and helping them build up the richness of where we were going. 
in our story. Um, I think Pentiman did that as well. Dick Pentiman. Um, uh, a quick note as well, watching that thing with the zoom into the grain and stuff, um, I promised Connor, our programmer, that we would tell you how great this was. Uh, we had like all these discussions around film grain, like film grain is so iconic and useful and we knew we were gonna be zooming into the image and exposing the grain, um, but we also knew that like when you compress video, grain does not work uh, and looks gross. Um, and we had lots of kind of soul searching discussions with our director of photography about how we would do this. Could we shoot on film? Should we not? Are we gonna shoot on digital? How are we gonna recreate the grain? Um, and we suggested, well, why don't we do it in game? We have a game engine. They were terrified, like it might look like crap, and you know, a lot of film grain in video games doesn't look very authentic. Uh, so we set out to do the best film grain, um, and uh, we came up with a system. So the way film grain works is there's two grains. Uh, when you first capture the image on the negative, uh, there is an initial grain that's created by the little imperfections and holes between the actual kind of uh, material of, of the film. And then when you take that negative and print it, and invert the image, you create a second grain. So there is grain in the light and dark of the image, has different properties uh, depending on luminosity. So we had a system whereby uh, the, the, the shaders would look at the luminosity of the image and then apply these different grains uh, in varying amounts. We had these fun little curves that we could set up in Unity for the different film. Each, each different type of film, we had scans of actual film grain that we turned into tileable textures, and then we could apply and tweak the way the luminosity gradients worked so that we were applying the grain. And you'll notice like where you hit the really hot burnt out whites, there is no grain, right? A lot of, of, of kind of film grain shaders will just sort of multiply and you'll see the dots everywhere. Um, so this we just kept tweaking and going back and forth on uh, to try and hit that authenticity and give us that beautiful kind of crisp grain when we were zooming in and out. So it didn't feel like a kind of compressed digital version of this, you know, this analog film that we were trying to celebrate. Uh, so we continued to, to kind of prototype and work on things. And so we spent a year tweaking the feel of scrubbing the film. Um, and our, we had this prototype build, so we hadn't shot anything. We had a bunch of clips of different films, and this was from uh, the eyes of Laura Mars, uh, a scene in which um, Tommy Lee Jones does take his shirt off. And like rewinding and, and, and tweaking film is so much fun, right? Me and Chris Nolan and, and Tennant are just like on the same wavelength of like, play, you know, people take clothes off, you play that backwards, it looks amazing. People shake their hair, play it backwards, see water, smoke, all these kind of things. They just look beautiful when you start messing around with them. So this was one of the scenes that I would just test and test and test. And we tried so many different things of like, how are you scrubbing the film? We started with this idea of like a moviola is quite mechanical, but we ended up kind of mixing our metaphor a little bit because we wanted it to have like a real tactile feel. So we are like, well, imagining the film reels, if you're touching the reel and you can kind of move it, but then you can spin it and it'll have some inertia to it. So we came up with these ideas of like flicking and what does it feel like to flick an analog stick? Then we realized you lose control. So we started like ratcheting it and, and locking you into certain speeds. And there was like, yeah, it was like a year's worth of just like screwing around uh, with the footage playback. Um, and as, as you can see there, I'm now technically married to Tommy Lee Jones. Um, he's a lovely, he's a lovely partner. Uh, and then we got onto the grid, right? This was exciting for me. Like in the previous games, uh, we'd always do a trailer and to show in the trailer just how much cool footage we had and the range and variety, we'd always end up on this visual of like a video wall. Like, whoa, look at all the cool stuff here. Uh, and on this one, I was like, what? Couldn't that just be the game, right? Wouldn't that be exciting? Uh, I was also like, my teenage years were spent going to video installations in art galleries. I was obsessed with those things. So just like big screens and, and walls of video is an aesthetic that I really appreciate. Um, and this is how we ended up with kind of our core interface of this grid that you can zoom in and out of and shuffle. Um, and, and the excitement for me here was uh, this idea of the map is the territory, right? It's, it's like a Borges short story about the idea of a map that is actually to scale. Um, and, and that's video games, right? Like we navigate these virtual worlds that, that have essentially an extent that is, is huge. Um, and here, this idea of an interface that does all these things I'm listing here, like it's, it's essentially your menu, it's your inventory of clips you've collected. Uh, it also serves as a kind of history because we have this symbol grid that every time you click on something, we're 
capturing that image. And the grid shows the place you parked the footage at as well. So it becomes very personal and specific to you. Um, so the idea that it was doing all these things and we wanted as well, like you never leave this screen really. You zoom into the footage and then you'll zoom out of the footage and you can teleport between bits of footage, but like you're essentially in this consistent world, right? It, again, it's like an abstraction of the edit room where you're surrounded by all the footage and we're just allowing you to feel overwhelmed by how much is there. And it also recalls like if you're a hardcore cinephile, you're going to, you know, there's sites that do like a frame from every minute of like your favorite movie and you can see how the color schemes shift across the movie and stuff. And it's like a really fun way to just kind of x-ray a movie. Um, a lot of this game was like, what is all the cool shit I do as a cinephile? How, how can we just trick the player into doing that without realizing it, right? Because they just think it's a game mechanic. Um, the one thing we did, we were trying to be so authentic in everything we did. The one thing, and we, we were so like torn about this, because uh, the aspect ratio of most gaming things is, is landscape, uh, to sort all these clips, uh, it made sense that the film strip would be on its side. But movie film, however, is vertical, right? So technically, if this was real footage, the strips and the little holes would run vertically down. We did briefly try that and it just didn't work aesthetically. So we were like, yeah, well, we know that we're breaking a rule here and that this is not real, but it's going to help everything in the long run. So we felt bad about it, but we pushed forward. Um, and then uh, the core kind of marquee mechanic of this video game, uh, the match cut. Um, let's see if we got time. This is, a, oh, this is such a good match cut. Uh, this is from Peeping Tom, a movie about people dying on camera um, and what that means. Uh, oh, look at that match cut. Um, Again, we like the, you know, the, the match cut is something people are going to be able to grok. It's this thing they will understand. It's exciting and fun. Could that be the mechanic at the heart of our game? Because um, we had been discussing, like, how do we make a mechanic out of cutting in film, right? How do we not have it be prosaic, like final cut? Like, how do you have that be interesting and expressive? And so we had this idea of, like, well, what if I could click on anything in any frame and have that then cut to something else. Like that's so expressive. You can click on anything. You're deciding what's interesting, what's aesthetically interesting. Um, and then we get really interested in this idea of, well, to preserve like the magic of the cut, you don't know where it's gonna go. Like the game is gonna decide where this cut takes you. Um, and that was fascinating to me because it was introducing randomness into a, a pure narrative game. And we know that randomness works in like Diablo loot drops, all these other game mechanics, um, but usually in narrative, you're looking for like this causality and this very simple kind of causality and, and logic to it. So I was like, oh, this feels interesting, right? It's a big risk, but let's explore what it feels like to have randomness in a story mechanic. Um, and it felt like teleportation. I'm like obsessed with the idea of teleportation. Like so many games are about moving faster, having superpowers, right? And this idea of teleporting around a narrative feels like a, a, a superpower. Um, I'm going to skip showing you the video because you know how it works. Um, so how did we do it? And this was like the big challenge. Um, I'm going to go really fast now, sorry. Uh, and, and I love uh, in-game, sometimes the solution is just to do a huge amount of work. And that's what we did. We said, well, is it possible to actually just track every single thing that we think is worth clicking on? Uh, and it was. Uh, we, would, we had a team of people in After Effects, uh, myself and Natalie would mark up, these are all the things that are in focus that should be clickable. Um, and then we had a team of people, you know, using tracking technology to track all these objects. We then had the complexity of having to compress that information, which was, you know, gigabytes per scene and in like VFX software uh, into these kind of simpler lower polygon animations so that every single object is constantly being tracked. Uh, there were rules for how things overlapped and things that were interesting. Um, and then we had this big lookup table that would tell the code there is an equivalence, right? An apple and an orange could cut together. Uh, Marissa Marcel playing Franny can cut to Marissa Marcel playing Maria. Um, and, and there is like a, a ranking to it, um, which I'll get to in one second. But also we, we kind of did a lot of iteration on, well, how do you click? We had a version where you, you could just click at any point and it would do the match cut. And we were like, ah, it doesn't feel sexy enough. So then we were like, well, let's make it a mode. Let's have to enter the mode. And then it becomes like a bit like Pokemon Snap or like sniper scope in an FPS. So we added this barrel distortion 
um, and a bit of a vignette so that as you're pointing and choosing what to click on, it's like taking a headshot in an FPS, um, made it feel more magical and more special. Uh, and then we have this algorithm, and this is how the game decides how to make a cut, and it's twofold. There's a kind of pre-calculated aesthetic where it decides what would be a good cut, and it looks at every single frame and decides these are good frames to cut into based on like permanence on screen, size on screen, motion, all sorts of factors. Um, and then at real time, it looks at, we have all this information about thematically what's happening in scenes, what various elements mean, uh, and it tries to choose a good point to jump to. And um, uh, maybe in the Q&A or outside, we can talk more about the specifics of that. Um, but it, it tries to do clever things and it has this kind of heartbeat. So it'll alternate between trying to connect things that are in proximity. And then it'll be like, nah, now it's time to like jump you super far in the story. It has an awareness of spookiness. So if you haven't seen anything spooky for a while, it'd be like, oh, maybe we should kind of come over here. So it's like a lot of fuzzy logic. So there's there's like a lot of... Uh, of, of, of logic to it, but it's not exposed to the player. It's it's kind of doing this meaningful little dance. It's like playing a kind of two-player party game, right? Uh, you you play consequences. I draw a funny little picture, and for it to be fun, you have to meaningfully respond to what I've done, but I also want you to surprise me. So this was kind of this interesting balance. Um, and then we have secrets in the game. There are some big secrets. We wanted this thing to feel alive and feel haunted. Um, so we, uh, we talked about Orson Welles again, about the War of the Worlds. Um, how he took radio, something people were so familiar with and kind of took for granted and then used that as a chance to actually surprise them and scare them and horrify them. Uh, I keep mentioning Orson Welles. Uh, the, the secret is we were trying to make the Citizen Kane of video games. Uh, so we were explicitly like, let's just learn everything about Orson Welles and that will get us there. Um, we did lots of prototyping on this idea of like hidden aspects to the footage. Uh, this idea, like I said, of like rewinding being a way of accessing and resurrecting and discovering things. Um, and we knew it was going to work because we did tests with footage of me during the pandemic, just at home. And it still frightened me, like when stuff would appear and pop out or fade in when I wasn't expecting it. Um, and uh, the few things we kind of iterated on in this mechanic that are interesting, um, Originally, we had a lot more of these kind of invisible cuts where uh, a character would walk off screen and then seamlessly we would transition to a different version of this scene. Um, and those were really cool and we used quite a lot of those in the game. But then when we were actually implementing them, we discovered that there were places where if we actually created a jump cut, that should actually be kind of more scary and more horrific. So we kind of started adding those in. Um, we have this concept of free floating moments. So a lot of the supernatural and hidden scenes are linked to specific instances, right? And are very located in the moment. Um, but to facilitate keeping things spooky, there are a whole bunch of scenes that are free floating that the code will attach to a clip. If it feels like, oh, you haven't seen anything spooky for a while, here's a place we could insert something and it'll kind of fit those in. So it's trying to keep things interesting. And, and then we played around a lot with what people now call the immortality noise. Like, how do we add these audio layers to hint on the menu, on the grid, and also within the footage to let you know there's something creepy. And usually people kind of start hearing that and paying attention to it. And then 30 minutes later is when they really like, hang on, okay, and discover things. But uh, thanks Metroid Prime, because we talked a lot about how Metroid Prime hints its secrets uh, with audio. Um, so now we've got two minutes to get into the spreadsheets, which is why you're all here. Um, everyone always asks me, like, how, how, do you, how do you do this? How do you create these things? Um, and the answer is, like, lots of spreadsheets, lots of outlining. Like, we started here with early plans of, like, the meta story of Marissa Marcel, figuring out the years, what was happening to Marissa Marcel across the different time periods. Uh, then we came up with the three movies, and we outlined and scripted out the beats for all of these movies. Um, then we got a producer to look at it and give us a shoot order of how would they actually have shot this movie, what order would it have been shot in, and transpose that onto Marissa Marcel's story so we could find synergies and beats of like, oh, if this thing happens to Marissa, it'd be cool if it happened whilst they were shooting this thing. We took these outlines, put them back into order, gave them to some of the greatest screenwriters uh, uh, in history, like Barry Gifford, Alan Scott, uh, Amelia Gray, who I've worked with before. Um, they went and wrote us the movies based on these outlines, like whole, full, finished screenplays of movies, brought those back, moved them around again. I sat down, and then I injected the making of stuff. I was like, well, if they're shooting this scene, 
what is Marissa saying? What's happening? What's the kind of behind the scenes drama? So we started to kind of work into these screenplays and create the story of Marissa that kind of weaved into them. And we get to a point where we have, okay, I'm, I'm nearly there. Uh, we had this sheet, which was called the organizing monster, uh, which is a giant, this is like a teeny slice of it. Uh, giant spreadsheet that is like everything in the game. Uh, and then we use what I call the hologram method, which is how do these nonlinear things that you make sound make sense? And the answer is like a hologram contains in every piece of it, like the information for the whole rest of the image, right? So we look at every scene and we have all these columns and it's like every scene has to meaningfully answer a question about Marissa's story, tell us a piece of plot beat from the fictional movie, have a piece of craft from movie making, have some hint at the meta story, uh, tell the story of what's going on with Arthur Fisher, what's happening with Robert Jones, uh, have a piece of imagery that resonates with our themes, of all three of our themes that we're tracking. And like, we just go through and make sure that every scene is doing everything so that then when the player starts combining them in different orders, they can meaningfully make progressions in theme or in story. If they're digging into a particular character or subset of the story, they can meaningfully put these things together. And as well, like having seen this thing, seeing this other scene, now I put the two things together and I get some, some kind of greater insight. So this is just like, it's all just about lots and lots of work and like just going over it again and again and again, iterating these outlines in these story beats. Um, so then uh, we're almost done. How do we then decide this thing works? How do you test it? Uh, it's just a script and just an outline. Uh, so we would take the script. Um, any object that was in the scene uh, would be underlined in the script. Um, and then the code would import the entire script uh, in fountain format, which is like this kind of markup version of screenwriting. Um, and it would extract all of the images, characters, and uh, we had this looping scene from Eyes Wide Shut and it basically generated the entire game of immortality based on the screenplay. So you could drop into a scene and it would just loop Tom Cruise taking his shoes off and then it would beat out the dialogue, time out the dialogue based on the script, place all the action lines. And every time an object or a character came into the script, they'd get this little box that would appear on the screen. So I could sit and play the whole game and click on these boxes and imagine the finished game, right? And this was never a useful prototype, but none of my prototypes are ever useful to give to, to normal human beings. But there's enough there that I can answer questions around pacing, discoverability, feel, flow, um, and kind of get to the point where we feel good. Um, and we can also run like algorithmic tests that tell us how interlinked scenes are, how frequently certain things appear, and we can kind of tweak based on that. So we basically just play this a lot we look at all the data we're extracting from the script and use that to balance the script and the format so that then we can go and shoot three entire movies and, and have a game that works at the end of it, right? Um, what next? This is it, it's my final slide. We're slightly over, but um, are there any takeaways? Uh, <laughs> if, if you want to make immortality, that's how we did it. Um, but I think genuinely there's, stuff that we're doing that I, I think is really interesting. Like this idea of randomness and narrative, I think is a really interesting thing to explore. Um, you know, we, we, we're so tied to narratives that are on train tracks and the idea of causality and systems that actually injecting a little bit of spice, I think is really interesting. Uh, thinking about exploring narrative content directly, right? You're not exploring a world and discovering bits of narrative, like you are in the weeds of the narrative. So many interesting applications of that. For me, Think about expressivity over simulation. Like, how is this meaningfully expressive for the player? How are they individually expressing themselves? If you watch two different people play Immortality, they will have very different experiences in their heads, but also in what they're doing, what they're clicking on, the flow through the game. Like, it's meaningful to them. It's meaningfully personable and, and, and kind of expressive. Um, and then just fundamentally, if I have one takeaway, it's like this idea of losing the container plot. People ask me like, how do your games still tell a story that makes sense if it's all out of order? And it's like, well, plot isn't interesting or relevant. Like plot is a requirement of a movie because people are sat in a chair and they need the toilet and they're getting tired and they're looking for 90 minutes or three hours if it's a Marvel movie, looking at the screen. Uh, and so plot is this thing that's like, keeps their attention, right? What happens next? What's happening next? What's next? What's next? We don't need that because we have all these other things. We have the challenge and the exploration and the expressivity. So we have an engaged audience. So these conventional ideas of plot and how you order and contain things 
are things that we can kind of move beyond. Um, that's something I would love to see more of. There we go. Uh, tail slates. Um, that's when you do when you have like a, a, a messed up shot and you can't actually get the clapperboard in shot to start with because it's all complicated. So at the very end, camera assistant runs in and says tail slates and they have the thing upside down. Um, and it's really cool. And it's never not cute to see the camera assistant run in excitedly to do and call tail slates. Uh, it's the funnest thing. Uh, I guess we can go outside if anyone has any questions. Uh, thank you for listening and putting up with me.